I want to welcome everybody to this evening's program on microplastics in our local freshwater streams and fish with Dr. Daniel Welsh. Um, we are recording the program, just so you're aware of that. All of our attendees are in listen and view mode only, so your audio is muted and your video is off. Um, we know that uh, many of you will have questions you'd like to ask Dr. Welsh, and you can put those in the Q&A panel. Uh, Martha and I will be watching those as we go along. Um, and I know Dr. Welsh is willing to take some questions during the program, and then we'll do more at the end of his presentation. So be sure and use that Q&A to, to get your question in. Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the NRWA. If you're not, we're a non Profit environmental organization. We do water and land protection work and environmental education programs for youth and adults in the 32 communities in our watershed. And the watershed sits in north central Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire. Uh, we're a member supported organization, so thank you to all of our members for making programs like this possible. If you're not a member, we sure hope you'll join. Um, you can look at our website, www.nashvilleriverwatershed.org to learn more about us, and there's membership information there. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Martha Morgan, who is our Water Programs Director. Thanks, Wynn. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Daniel Welsh, who is an Associate Professor of Biology and in the Biology and Chemistry Department at Fitchburg State University. He teaches courses in anatomy and physiology, evolution, and animal behavior. His research interests focus on developing a broad understanding of how fish adapt to changes in their environment. Daniel has a PhD in biology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha Wynn. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you all um, out there. Um, on Zoom land for attending tonight. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you today about it, about my research. Um, so um, give me a moment to just uh, share my screen. Um, yes, as Wynn and Martha um, mentioned, um, my interests are in understanding from a research perspective, how uh, fish adapt to changes in their environment, whether those changes are human induced or, um, or naturally occurring. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you today about, sorry, about um, microplastics in um, some freshwater streams and fish in the Nashua River watershed. Um, before I get started, I need to um, acknowledge a whole host of people that have made this work possible. Even though I'm the one here today talking to you, and I might, and I might use the word I, you might hear me use the word we, I tend to bounce back and forth between the two. It, it really should be we. It's a collective and collaborative effort. Um, this research would not have been possible without a whole host of people. Um, there were numerous students that have worked on this project, um, helping to uh, really collect all the data you're going to see, um, fine tune the analyses and the procedures that we're talking about. So it really would not be possible without them. Um, same with my collaborator, uh, Dr. Liz Gordon at the Fitchburg State University. Um, I know she is probably a name familiar to many of you on this on the um, the meeting because um, she has given talks in the past to the National River Watershed Association. Um, there are others that have helped along the way as well, and, and not in, um, individuals as well as funding agencies. And um, it also wouldn't be possible without many private and public landowners um, that have have helped um, to give us access to the streams uh, that we sampled in. Um, so I really do need to make sure that I had mentioned that these people are, I'm the only one up here, but really I'm speaking on behalf of a large group and I wanted to make sure that I started out by acknowledging that because this would not be possible without them. So um, let me get started. I know my talk is on microplastics, but I'm going to back up for a minute and just talk about plastic pollution in general. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the reason I want to start with this is because if you're you may not be familiar with microplastics, but you probably are familiar with plastic pollution. Um, it, it's received a lot of attention and you see some large, you know, um, I, I, you know, I kind of attention grabbing, uh, you know, eye popping uh, things like the great Pacific garbage patch 
that's floating out there in the middle of the Pacific, um, now twice the size. Actually, this is dated. It's now it's over twice the size of Texas. Now this is from a few years ago, um, and so you might have come across things like that. That's just these large collections of plastic buoys, nets, garbage bags, shopping bags, all this other stuff. And, or if you come across plastic pollution, you might have heard about things like um, or a these projections such as this one from the MacArthur Foundation and the World Economic Forum that talks about how they, pro they project and they predict that by 2050, by weight, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than there will be fish, um, which is obviously not a, not a thing we really want to hear and it's kind of an unsettling thought. But if you're familiar with plastic pollutions, this is probably what you're more likely to have encountered, at least in the you know, in, in the news and just um, when you're when you're reading something online, all of these are mostly focused on what are called macroplastics. These are large scale pieces of plastic, things you can see with readily and easily with the naked eye. Right, think back to this garbage patch. You can easily see this this big plastic buoy or these nets um, or ropes. These are all macroplastics, just on a very large scale. What I want to talk today about is what's called microplastics. We've been studying macroplastics for a long time now, um, decades and decades and decades, really probably for almost as long as plastics were starting to be made. There's been plastic pollution and there's been people under trying to understand this mac macroplastic pollution. Microplastics, on the other hand, is a pretty new uh, focus of kind of research and just general interest in the scientific community. Um, so if you may or may not be familiar with microplastics, so I wanted to make sure that we talk just briefly about what microplastics are, where they come from, before I delve into my specific research and get into a little bit more about what I'm here to talk to you about with regards to what I've done. Um, so what is a microplastic or what are microplastics? Well, technically, any fragment of plastic, any piece of plastic that's less than about 0.2 inches or five millimeters in length is considered a microplastics. They have started to also now go really small. I also talk about nano nanoparticles um, and nanoplastics. Um, for, the, for our purposes today, um, I'm not gonna get into that and really just gonna talk about microplastics, which really we can think of as anything five millimeters or about 0.2 inches in length or less. Now, where do they come from? Well, they come from a variety of sources. Uh, this figure on the right-hand side here breaks down just in a schematic and kind of uh, pictorial way, some of the different ways you could get microplastics um, in the environment. And this is not just the aquatic environment, this is could be land as well. They break them up into primary versus secondary microplastics. In my talk, I'm gonna lump them together and just call them microplastics. But in case you come across these terms or if you ever are reading about it, primary microplastics are ones that they were manufactured, the plastics were made as microplastics. So for instance, there are personal care products like facial scrubs and other cosmetics that have microbeads in them. Those are tiny little beads of plastic. So they were made that small, they were made as microplastics. Secondary microplastics on the other hand are microplastics that come as a result of essentially um, lar from larger macroplastics. So when you're thinking back to that great Pacific garbage patch, and you see all the, the big plastic pieces in there. Um, if those were to break down into microplastics, those would be considered secondary microplastics. So they can, they can come from clothing, industry waste, but it also can result and be a result of improper disposal of plastic waste. Um, because what happens is, and how do they get, in, they get into the water bodies? by either the microplastics, the primary microplastics, the microplastics themselves being washed in, or they can be a result of the plastic degradation. So if you can imagine, um, thinking back to these secondary microplastics for a minute, and you have these large, you know, you have a grocery bag that got blown out of a trash can is now sitting on the side of a stream somewhere or sitting on the beach of the ocean. And it gets subject to, you know, UV rays. Those UVs could start to cause the plastic to fragment, or maybe rain and wind beat on it, 
and just start to chip it apart and you get to these really tiny pieces. You can get physical breakdowns. You can also get chemical and biological. But the idea is that these microplastics can get into our water bodies. Again, we're talking about either, I'm talking in this case right now at the moment, it could be fresh water or it could be salt water. Um, as microplastics themselves, perhaps they just get flushed down the toilet and eventually make its way to the ocean or into a river or something like that. Or they could be broken down and these, these microplastics kind of leach in over time from larger macroplastics. So they can come from a variety of different ways and different sources. And if you've heard about microplastics before, odds are you probably have heard about it more in marine systems. There's been relatively recently some studies and, and some attention paid to this in the news. Um, and you might see you might see some, you know, kind of more eye-popping uh, titles like, you know, fish are fish are eating plastics, or there's lots of plastics in your in the fish you're eating or something like that. Oftentimes they're actually, they could be referring to macroplastics or they could be referring to microplastics. Um, but you'll, this is where typically you've, you may, if you've come across it, you probably have come across it in the marine system. Um, they look, they've been looking at it in the oceans. They've been looking at it in those organisms, the fish that occupy those habitats. That has been where the field has mainly been. And the field is relatively new. Like I said, we've been studying macroplastics for a very long time now. Microplastics is a pretty new field, generally speaking. Um, I would say it's probably only gained a, like a real um, major, you know, grab the scientific community and has gotten a lot more scientific focus in the past dozen years, give or take. So it's, it's still very early on. It might sound like a long time for us, but science is a very slow, long process and so 12 years is 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 in, is its infancy quite frankly but as i've mentioned really everything you're probably coming across for the most part is probably focused on marine systems so the ocean the marine fish that are in there and we need to understand why that is i just want to mention why that is why is there this, been this focus on these you know on these marine systems and these marine species well, part of it is just because, from an, at least from an economic standpoint, they're often considered to be more important. Think about all of the commercial fisheries that are out there, you know, feeding feeding the world. Um, a lot of the fish species that we eat um, are from mostly from oceans, marine systems. Also, for a long time, when thinking about marine systems, um, there was this. And, and microplastics in particular, there was this belief that the sewage treatment plants could, would be the source and kind of would be the way to stop all plastic debris from getting into the oceans. And um, we know now that that's not really correct. It doesn't, doesn't quite work as well as we had hoped and really that shouldn't be our only focus. But for a long time, that was the belief. And so how do you test if what you're doing to a sewage treatment plant is working? Well, you, you test the oceans because ultimately everything that everything that gets treated by the sewage treatment plant makes its way eventually to the oceans. Uh, it could go into a stream or river first, but eventually it'll make it to the oceans. So there was this idea that if well, if we can test what's going on in the oceans, then we know that everything you know if there's nothing there, then we know everything is fine, you know, upstream of that. Um, but again, we know now that that's not really the case, but for a long time there was this belief that that was the best way to to test what's going on, and so there was this huge focus on marine systems and ocean fish and just trying to understand what's going on in that system. But this leaves out a very large portion of habitats that are out there, right? Um, I haven't really talked to you at all about freshwater systems yet. Um, it, are microplastics a problem in freshwater systems? If they are, are they in the smallest streams, which are oftentimes thought of as a little bit more pristine? Um, you know, compared to the big rivers, you know, like the Amazon or um, or something like that. Um, how about these really small streams? Are, are they there? How about the fish that are occupying those small streams? The the organisms that are occupying these small streams are they are are they experiencing microplastics? Um, we need to kind of get a better understanding of what's of what's going on, 
And to do that, you need to kind of broaden it to the freshwater systems. And that's really where the research that I've been working on, um, kind of kind of the angle that I wanted to take it on and kind of the steps we wanted to go in. Because there, the understanding of freshwater systems and microplastics and freshwaters is very, very limited. The whole field of microplastics is is very new. But a recent review paper acknowledged that in this you know, relatively new field, our understanding of freshwater systems is even newer. It's really, as he described it, in its infancy compared to that of the marine environment. But m what I argue and what I think is what I think we need to realize is that you can't really understand the full scope of the problem unless you look at you take a very broad approach and a broad perspective on things. Um, if you're just looking at microplastics in the oceans and the marine fish, that doesn't tell you if the freshwater system, if it's also a pro problem in freshwater systems, right? Um, in order to understand, you know, how big of a problem is this, we we need to look not only we need to look at all the habitats. We need to not just look at the oceans. We need to look at the freshwater systems as well. We don't need to look just at the large rivers in the freshwater systems like the Amazon. That's great. But what about these really small streams that really kind of feed those larger rivers? In order to really truly understand if this is a problem, how much of a problem is it? We need to kind of take a very large perspective. Um, if if it turns out that the freshwaters are fine, great, right? It gives us, it would you could argue that that's great because then it helps us to focus our attention on where it needs to be, which would be the oceans, for instance. But we we can't really know what to focus on or if we need to focus on a particular area unless we look around first. And so that is that is one of the things that I was trying to help with this research, trying to help kind of fill in a gap a little bit. The other thing that I like to point out is that we, we besides just trying to, from this scientific and kind of more ethereal perspective, trying to understand, well, what's going on in fresh waters? Is it, is it a problem at all? Uh, we also probably, we, we should just think about, well, should we care about fresh waters? And then I hope the answer that we think of is yes. There's a whole host of reasons why fresh water systems are important for us. Um, there's obviously some economic importance, recreational, uh, fishing, swimming, kayaking, boating, this commercial fisheries in, in fresh waters as well. Uh, we can't forget that fresh waters are our drinking supply for the majority of the world. And that's not just for humans, but our, our crops are irrigated by that, our cattle and, you know, and, a lot, and all of our, um, all our animals in our nature preserves and are all, um, are all essentially drinking that water as well. And we understanding what's going on in the fresh waters help systems helps us to just make better informed choices about how to conserve nature, how to preserve what we have. I'm speaking to the Nashua River Watershed Association, so I, I suspect that most of you on here are probably all vigorously nodding your heads on this. Um, but to understand if it's a problem, we have to look first. And so again, um, I, that was where I thought we would kind of, this research would, would lend itself well to. We would, uh, it's just the first step in, in addressing it or looking at a problem, but it's a first step to try to get an idea of should we, where's the problem? Is the problem, you, are microplastics ubiquitous in nature? Are they all over the place? Are there only certain hotspots? Do we only need to worry about the oceans? Um, there's really very, very little out there on fresh wars in general, and there's even less known about what's going on in these very small streams and in the organisms that inhabit those smaller streams. So that's where the research that I did took over. And before I get there, actually, I just want to make, I want to step back for one moment um, and ask Martha and Wynn, is there any clarifying questions that might've come up in the chat on any of that, what microplastics are, um, what we know about them in a very broad sense before I go into a little bit more details about what I actually did? Um, I don't I don't see any questions right now. Daniel, Great. So I think you could just go ahead. Okay, Thanks. just wanted to make sure. Um, and if, any, if, do, if others come up, questions do come up, please can put it in the Q&A and uh, we'll be happy to answer them later as well. But let me talk to you a little bit about um, my these first forays into kind of assessing the microplastics in some of the freshwater 
systems um, around here. And so to do that, um, we collected we collected samples of uh, from water as well as from the fish to try to uh, to try to understand if there's microplastics in these uh, small streams and in the in the fish that occupy them. The the system I'm working in, and since I'm is in the Nashua River watershed, which um, many of you here are on the on the meeting are I'm sure intimately familiar with, but for those who aren't, um, the watershed is located here in north central Massachusetts. Um, it extends a little bit up into the into southern New Hampshire. Um, here's a more zoomed in uh, and picture of it to identify it. Um, this this line across the top is that's that border between Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So it's mostly in Massachusetts, but extends a little bit further up. Um, and there's the main stem of the Nashua River that runs starts around um, um, the kind of the the western edge over here, um, and then but then there are all host of smaller little streams, little tributaries that feed into this that aren't as obvious on this picture. Um, but that's what we were focused on. We were focused on these very small, what we call weightable streams. Um, they don't, you know, oftentimes they don't get more than more than hip deep. Um, and what we did was collected a water sample, one water sample from 14 different streams. The map on the right, I've added little um, red stars to indicate where these different streams were. Um, I don't have the names of the streams on here. You'll see them coming up later on. But just to give you a sampling, we, we tried to cover a large area of the watershed. Um, and so we, we had areas pretty far to the north, um, down to the south, east, and fair off to the west a bit. And again, what we did was we went out and collected water from one water sample from each of the 14 streams. So we had 14 samples in total, one from each of the streams. How we did that um, was using this long conical uh, net. I'm not going to go into all of the details behind it. I'm going to I'm going to kind of give you a quick uh, give you a little bit of a summary. If there are more specific nitty gritty technical questions about how to how to pro how to sample these or how to um, analyze microplastics later on, I'm also happy to talk in more detail. But just broadly speaking, what you do is you put these you put this net in the water, um, and we let it we let it collect a certain volume of water. We adjust the volume based on the velocity of the water. So that way we standardizing how much water we're actually collecting and how large that sample is. At, well, you can't see in this picture, it, but at the bottom of this net, you'll find a little um, container. So the net all funnels everything down to this, in this, to this little uh, container. And that's where the sample is actually being collected. So we left it in the water for, it was anywhere from about 15 to 30 minutes um, helps to Again, we we standardize it based on velocity, so we're collecting the same amount overall. But the 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 velocity dictated how long we spent it in. And once the time's up, what you do essentially is just pull it out of the water. Um, you can you can unclip this um, this container and and essentially extract the sample out of the container that was running through the water. You're essentially letting the water pass through the net and collecting everything else that was in the water in it. Now, we also collected samples from fish. Um, in particular, we focused on using the black-nosed dace. This species is a small, about one to two inch, um, inches in length, and a very common freshwater fish species around here. They're very abundant in, in many of the streams in our watershed. We sampled fish from five of the streams. We collected about 20 fish from these five streams. We had around 100, um, 100 fish in total. Again, whereas we had one sample from 14 different water, different streams, uh, we only had five, uh, we only had five streams that we collected fish from, but we collected uh, about 20 from each of those five streams. And the fish sampling, again, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, is, but detail behind this, but they were collected with pretty standard um, field collection methods. Again, here, is us, here are, are us collecting in two different streams. 
you can see when I'm talking about these small weightable streams, you can see the size of them, right? They're fairly narrow. They're not extremely deep, um, but um, but they are pretty abundant in black nose dace. Not every stream around here is, but uh, but this these five certainly had them. The other advantage of using black nose dace aside from their abundance is um, because they are so common in the watershed, they are um, they are a fairly integral part of the food web. They are feeding on aquatic insects, algae, things like that. And but in turn, then they're food for larger predatory fish like bass, for instance, um, or they could even be food for wading birds um, and other other creature, other or other animals that are that are using and hunting in those waters as well. So um, they do they are an important link in our overall food web in many of these streams in our watershed. So um, at each of these streams, we collected our fish again, any from 18 to 22, about 20. We brought these fish back to the lab um, where we were um, we measured them. So this is a little a little lab fish board. Each one of these little lines is a millimeter, and this was enabled us to get the overall body size or length of the fish. And then we were also able to remove their digestive tracts. We were interested in are these fish taking in microplastics? If they are, well, we figured they'd be in the digestive tracts, and so we removed the digestive tract from each one of these of these fish in order to assess how much is being taken in by the fish themselves. The samples, this is for both the water and the fish actually, were chemically digested. So we re tried to remove as much of the organic non-plastic materials, that's you know leaf matter, insects in the fish, maybe um, things that aren't plastics, but they're gonna be mixed in with our samples. We tried to chemically digest them. We stained them with a compound called Nile Red. I'll explain that in a moment. And then we observed those, um, we observed those samples under the microscope. There's many more details to this, but I'm just, again, just trying to summarize again, happy to talk more specific about it later on. But um, it, there's a lot of chemistry involved that I didn't think was, we didn't need to get into all the nitty gritty details. But I do want to talk about the Nile Red stain. Um, this is actually Dr. kind of an Dr. interesting Dr. Welsh, one. Yes. can I interrupt for one second? Absolutely. Um, before we move on, we yeah. had a question about whether you know what the mesh size was for the net you used in your water sampling. I think uh, maybe looking at what size particles you're capturing. Yes. Um, so this was if I um, we used a uh, if I have it correct. Yep, it was 150 micron plankton net um, with that catch cup at uh, catch cup at the back. So it was 150 micron uh, net. I think that. That was the question they were asking, correct? Yep. Thank cool. you. You're welcome. Um, no, I gotta go find where I was. Um, here we go. Sorry. Um, so um, the let me, I want to talk again. I'm not going to get into the all the chemistry behind it, but the Nile Red I want to talk about because this is something that took a that not a lot of studies do, um, although it's becoming more common in the literature. And actually, took us a while to to figure it out, but um, it's actually a, a good validation step. So Nile red is a stain. We used it again on all of our samples, so both the water and the water and our fish samples. And um, what happens is in all these samples, um, even though you go through a chemical digestion, you try to get away as much of the organic materials as you can, you are oftentimes left with things that you're not always sure about just by looking at it under a microscope, whether they're actually um, plastics or not. So we got things like you see this little pink reddish strand here. That's probably something synthetic. Um, it, you know, that's not a common color you see in nature. It may or may not be plastic, but it's probably synthetic. But on the other, but then you get other things that look similar in shape and size, like these things or this thing up here, that don't have the colors. Those are harder to know whether they're synthetic or not. They they could, if you're looking at a fish intestines, those could just be filamentous algae or something like that that they that they were eating and they were ingesting. As much as you try to digest away the um, all of the organic materials and just leave the plastic behind, it can be hard to it can be hard to truly identify whether you've gotten everything. And so, to avoid kind of overcounting or at least kind of overstating how many plastics are there, the Nile Red um, actually comes in handy. What it does, oops, is um, actually adheres to particles and that are just plastic. 
and it allows them to glow under a microscope. Um, and so this helps us to actually distinguish between the organic materials, which actually wind up showing up kind of more blackish and don't really glow. You can see a little bit in the background here. Um, and uh, from the plastic materials that actually wind up fluorescing and glowing under the microscope. And so, yes, I, um, I will talk more about this in a moment, but spoiler alert, we, have, we did find some microplastics, but the Nile red stain really helps you to, as a ground truthing. Um, if I, again, if I was just looking at this top image on the right-hand side here, it'd be hard to know if all of these strings are microplastics or not. Some of them may be synthetic, some of it may just be algae, but the Nile red helps you to feel much more confident in, our, in your assessment and in your determination that you're actually seeing um, plastic materials because it only adheres to plastic. And then when you put it under this fancy fluorescent microscope, it glows, which also makes counting a little bit easier. Um, so yes, we did see microplastics. And in fact, um, we, what we did was we counted all microplastic pieces, pieces that were observed in the sample. And microplastics were pretty interesting. Uh, when they show up and these pictures give you a much better idea of how much do they glow and how much do they stand out relative to the background. But they come in interestingly, all different kind of shapes and sizes. Um, this picture up here on the right actually does a great job of showing you the difference between these non-plastic pieces. You can see here in like these black lines versus the actual plastic pieces and how you can differentiate between them. But we saw, we saw strings like you see on this picture on the bottom left or in the middle um, bottom here. We saw just kind of amorphous little chunks, if you will. We occasionally saw something, some things that were very spherical in nature. These were probably those, you know, cosmetic beads, those little micro beads. It's hard to say for sure, um, but that's not a, but, um, but that's, that would be my guess. So they come in all sorts of different shapes, different sizes. Um, it, it was a, almost like being, looking out into the, almost reminded me of looking at a, you know, you, you see uh, astronomers and they show you these pictures of far away distant galaxies. We were looking at really tiny up close things, but it had the same, uh, the same interesting kind of uh, layout to it and coloration and just kind of, it was just a very interesting way of looking. But we, the whole point was to be able to clearly identify and distinguish between the microplastics and everything else. And then what we did is every sample, we counted every piece. We, we didn't distinguish between the different shapes and sizes and all that. We just counted every piece that we found to get to get a count. Again, we did this for the water, and then we did this for each of the fish. So we found I I already spoiled and I told you we found microplastics, but let's look a little bit more at the details and uh, the actual uh, results that I found. Let's look at the water first, and in all 14 of the streams we sampled, we found microplastics. Let me walk you through this graph. It'll look similar to the next one, but just to walk you through it, on the horizontal down here is the name of the stream. Um, it's it's put pretty much just, it, there's really, it's alphabetical, so there's really no, otherwise no rhyme or reason to it. Um, on the vertical axis uh, over here on the left, this is the number of water, of microplastics in the water. So what you see here is every stream had some, but there was also a huge range. Um, things like uh, flua, for instance, or trout, even sucker or james, um, they often came in at under 100. I think flua was around 50 um, or 50 or 40 pieces of microplastics. On the other hand, you had things like uh, gates or reedy or washakum, which were in the six, 700 range was Manusnak was actually about 950 or so. So there was a huge range of actually probably a roughly about a tenfold difference, um, but a, a quite, quite interesting uh, range here. We went in thinking actually, and I did a little follow up with, with on this. We were at one point thinking that maybe it was related to how urbanized 
the the area, the land use around the particular area the stream was. But interestingly enough, um, how developed it was, you know, what was around it, if it was you know, in the middle of a forest and very low urbanized area versus something that was much more developed and human impacted um, in terms of development of the land around it, actually did not, did not have a relationship. It did not explain the pattern we saw. So um, it's interesting to see a huge variation in our watershed, but it's also very hard to pinpoint what's, what's causing this. Um, we can talk about a little bit more about that later, but um, this was an interesting result, but it was also, it's, there's no clear, good, clear trend, unfortunately, that I would love to be able to say, oh, you go north to south and you see this pattern or it's, or in heavily urbanized areas, it's the pattern. Unfortunately, there's a lot of variation here. Um, so I'll come back to the water in a little bit, but I also wanna talk about the fish. Remember, uh, we, we collected water from 14 streams, but we only collected fish from five. These are the five that we collected from. So Asnabumskit, Falua, Manusnak, Trout, and Willard. I'll, be, I'll tell you right now, we collected the water and the fish at the same time. So we did not have the results from the water when we were collecting the fish. So we sort of, in a sense, got lucky in the sense that we went, managed to collect fish from the stream that had the highest amount in the water and the, the other ones tended to be really low. So we kind of wound up, wound up with the kind of the two extremes. That was um, a bit just random chance, actually. We did not plan it that way. Um, it makes for an interesting, um, interesting results, but um, that was actually kind of just coincidental because we were collecting the water and the fish at the same time. So what did we, what did we see in the fish? Um, let's look at our fish results. I, I will tell you that there, that there were microplastics in fish from all five of the streams we collected from. So again, here on the horizontal are our five streams. On the vertical axis over here on the left, it's a slightly different because we had a variety, we had a bunch of fish from every stream. We took an we took an average. The error bars are just a stand are just one plus or minus one standard error. Um, it's sort of like a standard deviation. It just gives you an it just gives you a range, a little bit of a range, plus or minus around the average, just to give you a closer estimate. Um, so, some things to see here. Well, first off, the there is a little bit of a range, but the range is much smaller. I mean, um, we really went from about a about a low of around forty-ish to a high of around eighty-ish. So, instead of that tenfold difference that we saw before, we actually only see about a twofold difference in the amount of microplastics in the fish themselves. The other thing I will say is that the microplastics were unfortunately quite abundant in the fish in terms of how many fish from each stream had it. At three of the streams, um, it was the actually as Asnabumskit, Falua, and, uh, and Manusnak, all 100% all of the fish that we, that we sampled had microplastics in them. At Trout and Willard, it was less than 100%, but it was still three quarters or more. So I can say, at least from our results, the vast majority of the fish had some amount of microplastics in them. Now, let's, uh, let's explore the data a little bit more and just show you a couple of other patterns that, um, that, we, were, that we were looking at. One thing, if you recall back to uh, one of the other things we collected is we collected the, the size of the fish. We measured the length of the fish. We were curious if perhaps, even though the fish aren't that big, if bigger fish might be collect, might be taking in more microplastics or maybe less microplastics. And oddly enough, or maybe not oddly enough, but um, intriguingly enough, I guess, the size of the fish didn't seem to matter. Again, we're talking about a small range, the smallest fish was only about 45 millimeters in length. The largest was about 80 millimeters in length. So um, we're still talking about pretty small fish, but over, but it's still a you know, two-fold difference in size. Over that range, there really wasn't a relationship between the size of the fish, which is shown here on this horizontal axis, and the number of microplastics in that fish, not an average, but the numbers in that fish. Um, there really was no correlation. So um, bigger fish weren't taking in more or less microplastics than smaller fish were, at least in this species across this size range. 
the other thing that we were we were wondering about is well maybe maybe the um, the amount that's in the water is actually impacting with how what's in the fish um if you look here what you find on the horizontal axis are the streams the vertical axis here has the number of microplastics and now i've color coded it by blue is for the water and orange is for the fish and this is the data you, the the data you've seen before, um, these were just kind of pulling the two graphs together. But when you do when you do an analysis, um, you find that there's actually no relationship between the amount in the fish relative to what's what's in the water around them. So um, you don't find, even though Manusnak was, if you go back to this other graph, was a little bit higher than these others. Um, if you do an analysis just on these, you actually find that there is no statistical significant difference between them. Um, and we also find no relationship between the amount in the water and the amount in the fish. So um, there is no difference in the amount in Manusnak compared to these others, even though Manusnak fish were in waters that had a lot larger amounts of microplastics than these other four streams. So um, there's some surprising results, I'll be honest. There was some stuff that came out of this that we were we were not expecting. I wasn't sure, we weren't even sure there are microplastics at all in this system, but um, we do now know that there are, but um, there was some other interesting patterns. So um, let me just briefly kind of summarize what we were talking about. This, this, liter this research that we did lends itself to, when you combine it with the other research that's out there, um, seems to suggest that, you know, microplastic pollution is fairly ubiquitous in nature, or at least it's not just a ocean and marine problem and marine fish problem. I don't want to overstate these results, but when you combine it with what other people are starting to do in some of these larger rivers, like in the Amazon, for instance, or people have looked in the Great Lakes in some of these really large lakes, they're also seeing it there. It's, it's starting to suggest that it's not it's a freshwater system problem as well as a problem in marine systems. And again, we were sampling some of these really small streams um, that would feed into these larger rivers. So if they're here, they're most likely probably making, it, my guess is they're probably making their way down. Um, we saw them, right, in these small streams. We saw them in these, in these small fish. So they are impacting freshwater systems, and it's not just a unique problem to large marine fish or ocean systems. Looking at the results that we have, um, actually suggests that the intake of microplastics, how much the fish are taking in, it could be a result of either a passive process. So the, there's been some discussion about whether fish are actively searching out these things and eating them because they're mistaking them for prey or it just looks appetizing or something like that um, versus more of a passive process where they're just, as they're going about their lives, just you know doing their fishy thing, um, they're taking in plastics along the way. Um, or it could be there be a, there may be some maximum amount that the fish can take in. You hit some kind of limit, and then they just can't absorb anymore. Or it could be some mixture of mixture of the two. If it was more of an active active process, again, I would have expected to see higher amounts in those Manusnak fish than since the Manusnak water had a high amount. Again, unless there may be some just maximum amount that the fish you can only absorb so much at a time. And so you just hit some maximum. That's also a possibility. It's a little bit hard to disentangle those with just this research. Um, there's actually a lot more that needs to be done. As I kind of said in the beginning, this was kind of a first foray to help us to try to broaden our understanding of what's going on and if how how big of a problem this is and whether we should be looking very broadly or if we should kind of look in certain areas. Now that we have these kind of first results in these in these first um, kind of glimpses of what's going on. We can design follow-up experiments to explore this in more detail. This, this leads to a lot of interesting, que a lot of interesting questions. Um, it, it, the results are always a little sad. I mean, this is not something you you want to find, um, and I'm not, I'm not happy that we have, we have that we found these things and that we have follow-up experiments that we could do. But now that we know they're here, um, we can really delve into a bit more. Um, 
specific research on you know the consequences and the impacts of microplastics in these systems and really delve into it in a bit more detail. So this is just the beginning, um, but I hope it's a uh, it's an interesting beginning, and I hope you've you've found it interesting as well. Um, and so with that, I'm going to I'm going to end there. I just again want to acknowledge everyone who helped on this project. This this work I would not be able to speaking without to you without all the help from my cl my collaborator, all the students involved, all of the landowners and their support and the funding agencies as well. Um, I want to thank you for listening. I see some questions in the in the Q and A, and I'm happy to answer them. Um, if you also think of questions later on that you're interested in or that come to your mind later on, which happens to me all the time, by all means feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer more specific questions uh, later on as as well. But for now, I will stop there. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. And i um, happy to answer questions that we have in the, in the Q&A. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, really interesting. And yes, it is a bit sad to see how much. <laughs> You know, microplastics we have in our little little tiny freshwater streams. Yeah. Anyway, we do have a number of questions, and I'm just going to start at the at the top. Um, a couple sure. of them, I think, um, if somebody wanted to know about the 14 streams, and and you did go over that, and um, the the mesh size. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the chemical digestion process? How did you ensure the digestion process was not destroying the plastic before it was recovered? Yeah. Um, so. I will say um, um, there is a there's a whole there's a whole actually big process behind this. We were following um, standard. I will say that we were following methods that have been designed and used on microplastics for in the ocean systems for a number of years. So we feel reasonably comfortable that we're not doing that. But um, the the chemical process goes through a bit of um, we there's a whole set of series. We we. We sieve it out to try to get out really the large organic material, so we're not just digesting away giant leaf particles. We're trying to get the smaller pieces. We try to we dry that out. Um, hydrogen peroxide is used to eliminate organics, which doesn't seem to really react with the plastics too well or, or too much. In the point that we're, it does not seem like we're really going to be destroying our plastic particles um, to to too much extent. Um, the heat will also help to bake some of that away. And we also do, um, I don't think I have that on here. We do a density separation, which also, because the microplastics are lighter than everything else, they'll float to the top. And so that will actually help to, um, to keep the microplastics from interacting too much with a lot of the chemicals that are being used and the, and the reduction reactions that are happening. So in general, I will say um, I am not a chemist and I do not claim to be a chemist and I will never, I will, I don't even claim to play a chemist on TV or anything like that. Um, but I will say that um, these methods have been fairly, fairly well vetted. So I feel confident that we're not losing a, a lot or we're not damaging a lot of the particles. And if we are, all the samples are being treated the same way. So our absolute numbers that we're counting may be off, but we're probably, we're not probably, you know, the Manusnox samples are not higher just because of the chemical reaction versus Willard, for instance. So everything, the numbers could be a little bit different. If you cared about the exact numbers, you may want to take those not with a grain of salt, but you know, I wouldn't, I, you know, it may be instead of 950, it could be 920, who knows? Um, but but I, I feel confident that um, the general patterns are consistent, even the, the precise numbers aren't totally that totally consistent, if that if that makes any sense. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, at what magnification are the, the images that you were showing? Yes, um, I'm glad someone asked that. I, I forgot to point out um, on some of these pictures, I have um, I have I have error bars. Um, it's probably a little bit more obvious to see um, on this. One, sorry, on this one from the light microscope. So this is a this scale bar is 0.1 millimeters. So generally speaking, these were magnified about 40 to 50. 40 to 50 times. We did zoom in and out a little bit um, just to get the, the best images. Sometimes you'd have to zoom out to, to kind of see things and then zoom in to really count really well. So we did change around a little bit, but I would say it was about 40 to 50 magnification in, in total. There was a little bit of variation, but that's roughly where we were in the range we were in. 
Okay, thanks. Now I know you're looking at mostly um, smaller streams, but somebody asked, did, did you look specifically where the wastewater treatment plants were in relation to the water samples? Um, so we we did we did not actually. Um, the at least the ones that I'm aware of are um, the ones that I'm aware of are in Fitchburg and in Lemonster. I mean, I'm sure there's some others through mm -hmm. some of the other towns, um, yeah. but but we were. Most of those, my understand from my what I know is most of those connect directly to the main stem of the Nashua, and we were or the we, yeah. yeah, or the North Nashua, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we were sampling the streams that would that are upstream of the north of the Nash of the main stem, so they would be before the wastewater treatment plant. So no, we did not. That would be very interesting to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the reason we could collect sample water samples from there, it's very hard to collect fish samples from there because of how deep. And wide it is, um, right. and so it'd be easy to collect water samples. A lot harder to collect fish samples, which is why part of the reason why we actually had stuck to the very small weightable streams. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you might not know the answer to this, or may you may, but um, somebody asked John Wells asked if uh, do chemicals such as benzene, styrene, or polystyrene, et cetera, leach into the fatty tissue of fish? That's a that's a very good question. Um, the I will say that there is a little bit of literature out there. Again, the field is so new that I don't, I, I would not, I would not put any money on this at the moment. I don't feel comfortable really saying for sure what the answer is, but there's a little bit of literature out there suggesting that yes, it does. Um, again, how it, it also seems like it suggests that it may actually be happening in humans as well. If we're ingesting these things, is it possibility of that? Again, the the field is so new that I don't think I, I I would not be surprised if a new re, if more research comes out and 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 says that that's not the case um, just because of how how new it is but the little mm -hmm. bit that is out there right now does seem to suggest that it it is possible okay. um, I I don't know if all plastics will do that or if it's just certain types of plastics may leach in um, that I have not really seen a very clear answer from in the literature um, this is the problem with this field not the problem but it's so new that there's new stuff coming out all the time, and I, there are questions like that that um, uh, we have suggestive evidence for, but I, I don't know. I don't want to call it definitive just yet. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so our watershed scientist, uh, Jessica Vasey Powell, asked, do you suspect that the relationship between water and fish content would change if you had a higher sample size for water? Hmm. That's an interesting question. So yes, th it is a limitation that we only got, we only have a one we only have one um, water sample from each of these streams. Um, it, it actually would be interesting to know if how much variation there is. Um, I, I, I certainly would expect, you know, after a heavy storm, for instance, um, you could see you could see changes in the in the numbers. Um, these are probably representative of the again the general pattern. Like I'll I would be shocked if you know on a just the typical average day, Manusnak is not higher than these other ones. Um, so I suspect that this is a representative of just the general pattern, but it actually, if I was, I, I would, you know, that would be something I would, I think is a worth a follow-up experiment to try to get a handle on what's the actual range in these streams, how much does it fluctuate after a heavy rainstorm, or if we go through a drought or something like that and the levels are really low. I think that's actually a very interesting thing that needs to be followed up with. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, I think the general pattern I suspect would hold would hold true. Okay. Thanks. Um, let's see, another question. Um, was there any correlation with pitch of stream, the swampy versus swift, sandy, rocky versus muddy, it's, et cetera, assuming there was such variety in the small streams? Yeah, that's a that's a very good um, that's a very good question that we honestly didn't take into account. Um, we only standardized it based on the water velocity, how much how much time this the um, you know how much time this, that that collection net was in the water. So we really didn't take, in, take into that account other than the velocity. So the those pitch streams obviously should flow faster. So we had this we had the net collecting for less time than the than those kind of you know low lying, more meandering, slower moving um, streams. But other than that, we we did not take any of that into account. We probably we should be able to go back and do all that, but. Um, and look if there's a relationship, but we we haven't done that yet at all. 
All right, thank you. Um, how would the amount of plastics in local fish possibly impact on local predators that feed on the fish? Yeah, that's an that's another very good question. Um, there is there is the thought that some of this, um, you know, th with these food webs, things can can bio bioaccumulate. I actually haven't seen anything in the literature suggesting one way or the other that things can bioaccumulate. But again, um, other than they're suggesting that in humans, for instance, we we might eat fish that are contaminated with and then then get and then get it into our our bodies, um, but I don't. I don't think there's a good answer at this point. Um, I would. I. I suspect there'll be some bioaccumulation, or at least um, some buildup, move up through the food chain, um, just because of the little bit that we see supposedly in in humans coming from, you know, fish-rich diets, and people get a little bit. But it's so new that I. How much of that? You know, how much of that accumulates from one food? You know, chain the food web to the next is probably is I don't really feel like we have a good handle on and how much of an impact that matters is the other quick, tricky thing is we still don't have a good handle on you know how many microplastics is quote unquote bad we mm -hmm. i mean you probably don't want i mean none would be ideal but you know are a few pieces really a problem it's it's hard to know even those you know even those leaching things that that other question was asking about and the chemicals breaking mm -hmm. in it's it's hard to know how much of that really starts to become a problem. At some level, it's gotta be a problem, but I don't think we know yet. So I bet it bioaccumulates, whether bioaccumulates to a degree that's problematic from one food level to the food chain, it, I don't have, I couldn't hazard a guess one way or the other, quite frankly, at this point. Okay, all right, thanks. And the next, next three questions are all from board members, NRWA board members. So right. there's one from Ralph Baker. Um, do you have a sense of uh, if this represents a tox toxicological problem for the fish or what um, might be eating the fish do these pots okay so it's another yeah. question about bioaccumulation yeah um, I don't think I don't think we know that one way one way that I can right. tell you just from collecting the fish I mean outwardly they did not look sick or or malformed or anything like that that doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. mean that there was any internal problems but I outward they looked fine but again I don't think we we know that at this point unfortunately I would love to know that actually okay Joan Watkowitz asks, um, you may have said this, but what was your reason for starting with the smallest streams? Can you speculate what your findings might be if you move to larger tributaries and move up toward the main stem of the Nashua? Yeah, um, so part of the reason we used the, the smaller streams was, was to, to be able to, to collect the, the, the dates, to be honest with you. But another part was my thinking was these smaller streams, you know, they're the, they're the beginnings of, of the river oftentimes. They're, you know, there's usually not smaller streams even feeding to them. So like they're the, they're kind of oftentimes for correctly or incorrectly thought of as more, most pristine, if you will. Um, and so my, my thinking was if they're, if they're, if we find them in these really small streams, then we, we, they're gonna be found elsewhere. Um, they're gonna be found downstream. I, I mean, so, I would expect that these smaller streams are delivering the microplastics into the larger, into the larger main stem. And I, I would imagine that if you did this in the main stem, you would you would find even higher, higher numbers as you go. Just I mean, it's partly to I mean, who knows? It could be this. A lot of it could be the how much pollution and plastic pollutions in those in the main stem is hard to say. But uh, some of it will probably be also be a result of the microplastics coming downstream from these smaller smaller streams that are building up into it. So um, mm -hmm. the reason for the smaller streams partly was to be able to access the fish, but also partly because I figured if they, if it wasn't going to be there, that would be the place it wouldn't be there, if that if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You wanted to find out what was up in those upper uh, headwater streams. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. I, I know just from looking at the, the distribution of the streams, um, Manusnock seemed to be the most urban um, stream that you sampled. It um, it was. Um, I have a I have a map of that. It's a little bit hard. I realize it's a little hard to see, but um, the the blue areas um, do show um, more urbanized areas, mm -hmm. and um, and so uh, Manusnak. Actually, we sampled we sampled Manusnak actually right behind the um, the 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 mall. Uh, right. It, in, it flows through the center of Lemonster. So right. Yeah. So yeah, right. the mall, you'd be collecting a lot of um, 
you know, materials that are coming off the, the land all the way through the center of the, the, the city. Right. Um, that is true. Although, interestingly enough, we, we would, I would have thought that that would have been shown up partly in the urbanization measurement um, a little bit. Um, and um, even, and, but there was no relationship between urbanization and amount of right. microplastics. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, urbanization wouldn't capture necessarily that fine scale results. Um, and I'm sure that the location, that part of Manusnak, I mean, it's surrounded by shop, shopping centers and all that ha has something to do with the, with the levels. But, um, yeah. but I think that also shows you that it's not just urbanization. It may actually be what's going on at that very fine scale, precise location may be dictating at least yeah. to a degree how much is actually in the water. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this one's from Susan Edwards. Um, are estrogen mimicking compounds one of the problems associated with microplastics being found in our small freshwater streams and fish? There is limited, but suggestive evidence that that they could be playing a role. We know that's a problem with larger uh, macroplastics. And it mm -hmm. seems, again, with the very limited studies that are out there, it seems like they could potentially be having some estrogenetic effects. Again, I, I we don't, I wouldn't say it's definitive yet, but it seems suggestive at least, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is from Emanuela. Um, hi, Dr. Welsh. Thanks for the informative and interesting presentation. Do you think that elevation or slope might be a factor in the amount of microplastics in the samples or proximity to wastewater treatment plants? So I think you've already answered most of those questions, That most of that. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll we, we, again, we tried, tried standardizing that as best as we could by adjusting how much, um, how long we collected the sample for by using velocity as a, as a proxy. It's not perfect, but it, it, it helps at least get rid of some of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just a comment. Thank you for your informative presentation. Continue with your research. Um, another question from Diana Sharp says, um, thanks for a great talk. Uh, why do some plastics show up as red and some as green? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, I've I've read in the literature that it's a that it's it's suggestive of what type of plastic it's from. Um, but then mm -hmm. actually, but then I actually I went to a I went to a conference over the summer and was talking to some other people, and and they didn't they didn't believe that, um, and so I I'm not sh I up until I I talked to that person I would have just said oh the answer's got to be what type of plastic it is now it doesn't I'm not entirely convinced we know the answer to that actually okay um, so yeah there are ways to actually figure out what types of plastics these are, it would take a little bit more, um, it would take a different type of instrument than, than what we use to just count and um, can be a little bit harder to use, but um, I have, I, it, there is a way to determine some of that, but I'm not entirely sure why, I, I think I bet it has to do some with the type of plastics, but it may be more complicated than just simply what type of plastic it is. Okay, thank you. Um, and, Let's see. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, Jessica asks again, were you worried about contamination by your sampling tools? We we were. Um, and I didn't I didn't mention this, but um in my in my talk, but every time we we did a sample, whether it was water or the fish, um, we also created a control um, to try to get at how much was in microplastics were like in the water we were using or contaminated by the clothing we were wearing or the tools we were using. And we actually, um, we did have some in our controls. And so these numbers actually are, are, we took the control and we subtracted it from whatever number we got. So these are actually lowered. These numbers were actually lowered by the amount we had in our control. So try to standardize it that way. And I, I was worried about it, but I think we did a pretty good job of at least standardizing for that and and preventing that from totally throwing off our results. Okay, thank you. So Deborah Gallagher asks, how do you suppose the microplastics are finding their way into our streams? Yeah, I think it's from a variety of these different these different sources. I mean, it's probably a combination of the primary microplastics as well as the secondary. Just from my own personal experiences, I mean, I can tell you from walking around those streams, I, I see I see plastic water bottles all the time. 
I see I see garbage bags all the time, but um, but I've also come across clothing, which I'm sure some of them had microplastic fibers in them. I bet our sewer treatment plants are not designed, as far as I know, to to handle like the microbeads and all those cosmetics. In fact, a lot of the cosmetics have started phasing those out for this for that reason. Um, but I I think it's a combination of the macroplastics degrading, as well as the primary microplastics just making it through you know, runoff over the street or through a, uh, you know, residential sewer, sewer system or something like that. I think it's a combination of a bunch of stuff. I think we talked about this a little bit before, but um, when he points out that the Manusnak is a much larger stream than most of the others that you sampled and flows through Plastic City, mm -hmm. <laughs> Pioneer Plastic City, which is Lemonster, yeah. um, yeah. where plastics were manufactured, which would cause one to expect many more plastics in the water. It doesn't seem to fit with your other sampled streams. So I was wondering how you determined, you know, how urbanized the streams were, because just just my, you know, uh, blanket knowledge of the, the streams, you know, as I as I saw them, it looked like Manusnak was probably the most urbanized, but it 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 definitely it it definitely is. Um we we measured urbanization by um using the um we could we use some GIS tools to actually determine um, there's a way of measuring essentially how much land, how much land use, it, it, land use gets categorized into different things, resi um, urban land use, uh, uh, forested, um, things like that. And, and there's actually a GIS, a GIS tool that actually can measure, you know, where you are in the stream and everything upstream of that, all of that land use that's upstream of that what percentage of that essentially is falls into those categories that you that you consider human human you know human created urbanized areas mm -hmm. so it's 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 not looking at the right there and then at that very tiny spot that you're at but looking at from that spot and everything upstream of it because all that should eventually be flowing into that spot that you're at so it's actually an interesting question is you know could it be that that urbanization may not be the best way, even though that's a very common way of most scientists measuring it, it, it may not be capturing what's going on at that particular exact spot in the stream because everything upstream of it is all forest, so it's got a large, a low urbanized, urbanized area. Um, so it's not, it, it may be too zoomed out to really capture at this very fine scale. And I, and I, I think that's something that is interesting to follow up with, but it is a pretty, we we did it that way because that is the very common way of doing it across the in the scientific uh, research, and so we were following suit what most most people had done previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just uh, I was thinking impervious services. Um, yeah, was... yeah, we did we did break it down by we looked at percent impervious. Um, we tried urbanization a couple of different ways. We actually looked at percent impervious. It it didn't make a difference what variable we used that counted as as oh. urbanized it, the results the results really showed no relationship between whatever you characterize as urbanization and the actual amount of water microplastics in the water itself mm -hmm. okay but it's it, just that location where you sampled it, it could be what's what's very interesting though is things like um so like gates brook for instance which was a fairly had a fairly high number not the highest not the highest but fairly highest this was a stream um very close to the Wachusett Reservoir is literally in the middle of a forest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm I'm not I'm not lying. Like it, it's it's in protected DCR land. I think it um like you can't just go you can't go driving through it. Like it's right next is very close to the reservoir and it, and it had pretty high numbers too. So mm -hmm. sometimes what was like in your immediate vicinity didn't always, you know, I feel like I was in the middle of the forest and a couple of these came up with the really high numbers and it was surprising to me. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah. I was, I was quite shocked by that, by some of these results in that respect. Okay. Right, right. Um, so thanks for the great talk. Any success in identifying the plastics? We have, uh, we have not tried, we have a machine that will, would help us do that. We haven't gone in that direction um, um, just um, for, um, we had a little trouble getting the machine to work properly, but also um, we were more interested in trying to quantify what was out there and get and get our handle handle on how big of a what, what those numbers were. We were less interested in the actual 
types of plastic. So there is ways of doing that. Um, it might be something we follow up with in the future, but at this moment, we don't, I, I couldn't tell you what, what types of plastics are actually, are these different shapes and sizes and all that. Okay. All right. It's a Thanks. good question though. Mm -hmm. So just two more questions. Um, do black nose, do black nose dace ever spend time in rivers? I guess they probably mean bigger rivers. And what is the migration range? And um, this is Lisa Engel. She said, I'm, I'm assuming I got the name of the fish correct, black nose dace, right? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, so they are found in the main stem of the Nashua. Um, I found them in, um, in the heart of Fitchburg in, in Riverfront Park, for instance. Um, I've found them in Cook Conservation in Lancaster. So they are in the main stem of the river and not just the, not just the smallest tributaries for sure. Um, how far do they migrate? There's nothing on the black nose dace per se. We have no data one way or the other. Generally speaking, um, the, the smaller the fish, the less, the less, they, the less they move. Because um, obviously, you know, going, going a mile upstream is a very long distance for when you're only two inches long. <laughs> That's right. Um, so typ typically speaking, you know, um, there probably isn't, you're not, they're not traveling, you know, miles and miles like, uh, like you might, you know, like salmon do or something like that. They're most, it's generally, again, there's probably variations out there, but generally speaking, small fish tend to do a lot less large range movement, uh, you know, on the order of hundreds of meters, so, you know, um, mm -hmm. and not, and not kilometers sort of thing. Um, right. So their movement is pretty relatively, relatively limited. Okay, thank you. And let's see, um, Ralph Baker asks, and you have the right picture up, the upper right, upper, upper left image, um, is the red cloudiness due to plastic or something else? Um, that is something that's, that is not plastic. Um, they would, they would show what they that it's too diffuse for the plastic. I think that was actually just a little bit of the stain that didn't that dried on our on our um on our slide and just mm -hmm. um and just kind of um we didn't rinse it off very well, pretty much. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's it for the questions. I think we've covered pretty much everything. And um, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Thank you all for listening too.